Hi, we're back at the National Press Foundation talking about cyber security, cyber conflict, ransomware, zero trust, and disinformation, and the connections between all of these. So uh, welcome back. I'd like to welcome John Welburn and Tom Wingfield from the RAND Corporation. Um, as some of you have seen, John recently wrote a uh, very interesting piece on ransomware for the LA Times that you can find on our website or the LA Times uh, site talking about what can and should be done to defend against ransomware. And Tom Wingfield, who is formerly uh, a Deputy Secretary of Defense um, in charge of cybersecurity issues at the Pentagon, and formerly a professor who actually understands the rules of cyber conflict and is part of the discussion on uh, what is to be done or not done in this case. Um, and we'll be taking questions. Um, journalists on the call, I wanna urge you to um, raise your hand or drop a question in the chat and um, ask your questions. Um, I'd like to start with the ransomware and then move to the uh, what is to be done piece um, next. So Jonathan, first of all, uh, thanks for joining us. And can you talk about um, ransomware and what you think could and should be done? We heard in the beginning of uh, the program, uh, Vasu Jakal talking about this massive uh, ramp up in, in ransomware attacks and how easy it is for, uh, for uh, uh hackers to get in through just a whole plethora of different um, avenues and how there is no one single solution. You have to do 50 different things to keep them out. Um, and you've been thinking through the implications of retaliating. So can you talk to us about what you think ought to be done, could be done, and shouldn't be done? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I know we have slides. Happy to do it with or without slides. Um, but uh, if, if we want to pull those up, but the the yeah so so answer so it's nice that uh, I I had caught Vasu's talk which which was fantastic uh, you know for those who hadn't there's there's some value in in defining this uh, because the ransomware as a term is also often thrown out there it is the combination of ransoms and malware and there's malware for ransom the malware being the type of of, of of, of cyber attack essentially, which is designed to uh, come in through some vulnerability in your system uh, and, and take over your computer and allow the ransomware attackers then to say, well, I'll unlock your system, your files, uh, what have you for money. And this has really gone from events which were a nuisance uh, several years ago, incidents where the random individuals were being hacked by uh, small small time hackers really that were after small amounts of money and slowly we've seen these escalate into larger and larger sums uh, really getting into the fantastic sums in, in, in the millions and multi-millions uh, in the past year and col the colonial incident I think really brought massive attention to this issue with ransomware where a pipeline operator in the United States was hacked by a by the dark side, this this group of hackers, and they ransomed back the the keys to their software, uh, sorry, to their systems for a few million dollars. But the, the main issue with them was the actual impacts to society because when when colonial was out, that meant that the pipeline was out, which meant that uh, that you know, gas prices were soaring, and it really highlighted the national security implications. So we've gone from, from a nuisance to something with clear national and economic security uh, implications. So as these, and as these, the ransomware has gotten more attention, it's, and, and as it's really escalated over the years, uh, then it, really what's happened is that we're seeing that there's this tie with the higher the societal cost, the higher the reward. So in fact, it's more beneficial to go after instead of you know, a random person on their computer, it's more beneficial for the hacker to go after a hospital or to go after a pipeline operator. And that's exactly what they're doing. And they're, they're realizing that they can get more benefits from organizations which have larger uh, outsized impacts and, and a, a higher willingness to repay. And really the incidents like Colonial are a great advertisement for their 
business model, the ransomware attacker's business model. I think it's helpful to think about it like that because the, it's it's telling the world, hey, if you just pay us a ransom, we'll give you everything back and you can go about with your business. So all it cost you was $4 million. So it's great advertisement. And, and the other problem uh, to highlight with this is that a lot of these, like the dark side hackers in the colonial incident, actually operate outside of the United States. There's a lot which are in, in the, the people have highlighted in Eastern Europe, which target organizations outside of Eastern Europe. And they really exist outside of the arm of US law enforcement and are another complicating factor. So we, we talked about all of these points in, in the, the commentary that Tony mentioned and, and really said that the US should be thinking about a policy which tries to make it harder to, to, to break into systems, uh, to hit back harder against with, with higher retaliation, which I love talking about. So we can talk about that more and have you take questions. And, and as well to, to, to pull back the gains from the attackers who do succeed. So, and, and, and they, which, is, which is what they did in the dark side case where they were able to go back and seize stolen Bitcoin, which is a great strategy to say, even if you win, you still won't get the benefits. So there's a couple comments on, on my next slide about what journalists could be thinking about uh, after the next cyber incident. And so some of these are essentially who did it, what did they do, and why did they do it? And so that's getting into the sort of the intentions of the attacker. And one of the points here that's complicated is that is that attribution is a notoriously difficult part of each cyber problem. Cyber attackers operate with some degree of anonymity, which is which is a which is a fundamental part of their actions um, and the and the challenges. And so a question with this that's tied up into that is whether or not a given incident, a ransomware incident, was a criminal action, a nation state attack, a false flag incident, or some very various different things. And false flag is a cool term, right, that, that goes back to people fought, flying uh, a, the, a different flag on naval vessels to, to kind of you know, obscure their identity. And, and the same thing happens in cyber, where nation states might do things that kind of look like a, another organization and, and can, th there was, there was a, an incident a few years ago with, a, with a, an attack which took over the French television network TV5 uh, month. And they had, when, when they carried out the attack, they had taken, they had placed Je suis, I think IS on the, uh, across the TV5 uh, stations. So people just saw that black screen and they had made it look like the cyber caliphate. So trying to obscure it to look like ISIS. And instead it was actually determined months later to be a Russian attack. And so there, there are these attacks like this where people can obscure their identity. The other things are what are the actual consequences? So the cyber attack really doesn't stop then. It's not just a cyber problem. It can quickly become a infrastructure problem or a problem with, with great economic consequence. Then as well, what the response is, uh, what it, will there be criminal after, uh, a criminal effort? Will there be a, a, nation, a, a national response? I think that's something that's very important to ask, even if there is not an answer to kind of keep pressure on this question. And will there be an effort to hold the counters, uh, uh, sorry, the hackers accountable or the nation states, uh, th which will, can they either cooperate? If they don't cooperate, can they be held accountable? And, uh, and as well, there's a great ongoing conversation about liability for, for negligence. So the victims aren't necessarily off the hook if they didn't follow obvious practices for securing their systems. I'm happy to pass it to Tom or answer questions. Okay, so we're open for questions. Um, please raise your hand or put your question in the chat. So Jonathan, let's start with the obvious. Why would any nation state own up? Why wouldn't they just, unless you're a terrorist group like ISIS and the French attack that you described and they want credit for the attack, why would any nation state out themselves? Why wouldn't they just say, oh, that wasn't us, of course, it was some you know, criminal group, we have no idea, we'll crack down on them. Why would anybody out themselves and how can we uh, know in anything approaching real time, whether it's a state or a genuine, uh, you know, for-profit group? 
So I, there's, there's a few things there. Um, one, and, and this has been the case, that a lot of nation states won't out themselves. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's right. But there, there may be cases where they do or, or come close to where you either want to project power uh, to show the world, um, hey, we are, you know, country X and we're really good at this. Um, and, you know, that, that can stretch from Russia to Vietnam, right? They're, they're, to North Korea, North Korea, you know, projects a lot of power in this, in this space. Uh, so so there, there might be reasons why you would want to do that. You might want to as well project, project that as a, as a part of your deterrence policy to say that, yes, we can, um, we can we, you know, we, we have this capacity to retaliate um, if you do something. We have this capacity to disable your weapon systems if you do something in cyberspace or otherwise. So, so there may be those, uh, those reasons why a nation state would own up to it. But of course, in many cases, uh, they might not. And in many cases, it will be very challenging to understand what a nation state is doing. And there are plenty of previous attacks from, uh, from th that are more on the espionage side like OPM, like State Department, like uh, Equifax, which all might be the exact same nation state attacker, and it's not clear what they're up to. Um, and so I, I think those, those, be a diff those can be a difficult story to string together. But they're, they're also the kind of, in the, in, this, in the large number of attacks, kind of the, the rare ones. They're the part that's the most interesting to me, but they're, they're not the most frequent. Uh, but the other thing to highlight is that attribution has gotten quite good. Uh, and in many cases for, for, the, for the nation state in, intel organizations, they can be very good at doing this very quickly. Even for many, there are many private organizations, we can point to the FireEyes, the CrowdStrikes, they're, they're also very quick at, at being able to collect the evidence and they've tracked many different groups. And so they're able to say this, these tactics and these techniques and these procedures look like this group X. So we're going to, you know, kind of supercharges their investigation uh, to do that quickly. Let's go back to uh, the case where you, there's an attack and you're trying to figure out, you know, who done it, right? The first line of journalistic uh, attack is, you know, who, who did it and why? Um, to your point that um, the more civilian the target you pick, the more lucrative because you have to pay them. If you're a hospital, if you've got people on ventilators, you just gotta pay up, right? So this is kind of the opposite of the work that was done, I'd say earlier in the 2000s and the 90s, where we thought that it was all about states and attacking national assets. But you're kind of arguing that it's the other way. The commercial assets are, are, are a better target in some ways than military assets. You know, I, I think it's, it's um, probably a, integration of cyber with all of the things, you know, and so what you have is all of, you know, criminal groups, nation state groups, all operating in cyberspace to do the things that they used to do. Uh, so you have the criminal groups just realizing that it is more profitable to do this in a cyber domain. And maybe it's not the same groups as before, but still it's, it's that, so you, you have the criminal groups operating alongside, you know, various other groups. And, it, and it's more about what their incentives are. And so the, the incentives of a criminal group is really to shake down the biggest uh, civilian organization out there that, that can pay the, that can sign, write the biggest check, right? Or, or to shake down as many as possible um, so, that, so that you can do that as well. Whereas a nation state might have different objectives. So, so you really are still talking about both. They're just kind of operating in parallel. If you're, um, let's go back to the definitions. If if I'm a bad actor and I'm a private group and I hack your pipeline, it's a felony. If I am a state and I hack your pipeline, it's kind of an act of war. And Tom, I wanna to bring you in here on, where is the line between uh, what is in fact uh, an act of war versus a commercial activity? You know, we had piracy acts back in the 19th century. We had a lot of discussions on when a pirate was a pirate and when a pirate was a state, especially if you're fly flying a false flag. Can you walk us through the how journalists can think about these legal issues? Um, absolutely. And this is one of those Welcome. nice areas where there's absolutely more clarity than, than the average layperson would think. Um, any, a journalist looking at one of these should ask three questions, first of all. 
what is the law enforcement perspective? Is it a crime or not? Does it violate 18 uh, U.S. Code 1081 um, and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the seven federal crimes? And you're absolutely right. Almost everything being done to us violates one or more of those fundamental federal um, uh, limitations. So ask the law enforcement question first. And the Bureau and the DOJ are great at explaining this and walking people through that. Second ask, is there an intelligence community or an intelligence activities component to this? Um, as far as who may have done it, why they might have done it. Um, as you know, there are no international limitations on intelligence collection or espionage, but country by country, it is definitely a crime. And so you can look at um, what was done and see if this falls into the espionage category and then talk to the, the people at ODNI and other places. And obviously there it may be a short, shorter conversation depending on what they're able to say. But as far as categorizing what was done and what the offenses would be, that's another dimension of looking at any major cyber activity. The third one, and the one I spent most of my research agenda on, is military operations and cyber. Specifically, what's the threshold um, uh, as an international lawyer by training, we don't really use the term act of war. Uh, that's for policymakers, and that's totally legitimate for the people making the decisions. Lawyers will say it could either be a use of force, which is unlawful, but does not permit an armed response, or it can be an armed attack, which is not only unlawful, but it is so damaging, it does permit um, an armed response. So judging those two thresholds, use of force, okay, it's unlawful, we can't blow them up, but we can do A, B, and C in return. It's good to know what that is. And there are, there are tests we have for that. We can talk about that if anyone's interested. A little bit higher up, you actually don't need a lawyer to explain it because there's gonna be a smoking hole in the ground. And once you have the equivalent of a smoking hole, uh, people are dead or injured, property is damaged or destroyed, a significant amount of uh, property, you know, tangible or intangible, disappears. Then you have the equivalent of an armed attack. And whether it was done kinetically or by cyber means is really secondary to the severity of the action itself. And nation states will deal with severe actions like that, depending on how bad they are and what their military capabilities are. Obviously, the United States is an enormously capable state, so um, that is rarely our limitation. Normally, it's a prudential limitation about um, to whom we want to start doing these military things or not. Okay, well, thank you for that, that overview. And Jonathan, let me go back to you and let's start talking about responses. Um, and striking back and the what, what could be done, what should be done, and what are the consequences of it? And Tom, you can interrupt, of course, as we go. So I, I think that there are there are plenty of, of actual uh, potential actions. And some of the ones which are less intuitive, perhaps to start with, about what can be done, and, and more on the controversial side, is the fact that there's been plenty of discussions of what non-state act, you know, what organizations and what uh, corporations can do. And so some of that has been an argument that corporations and other groups should be allowed to uh, essentially hack back. And there are plenty of, there, this is a, an issue which comes up in Congress, you know, continuously of, you know, is there a hack back bill and, and you know, what, what, this is going to go up for debate. But it, it, I think there's, there's plenty of pros and cons to this argument, probably more cons than pros. But anyway, I think that there are, uh, that's the idea that says uh, if, if, a, if a Microsoft uh, so is, is, is targeted, that they should be able to launch uh, malware back and, at, at the organizations. And there, there is some of that is totally possible today um, and is less controversial. So Microsoft can, of course, find that there are um, that the, there, you know, if there's a hacker group that operates within its systems that, that's within Azure, they can kick them out. And, and that is a nice way of imposing costs. Uh, 
but but there you know there, there's a good range and other some of the other ideas out there that are, that are quite interesting sticking with the maritime theme is is pulling from old maritime laws which allowed uh, um, some some organizations to basically go down and chase uh, chase other actors and and be able to operate you know kind of with within um, kind of act, operating as though they were part of the U.S. government and and that they. They can chase these down and share information about hackers with the United States government. So there's many ideas out there um, as far as ways of imposing costs from the private sector. But then, of course, there's the there's the you know what the United States government can do to impose costs. And I've talked about that a bit. I will. Tom knows much more <laughs> than I do, uh, so I can I can talk as a complete outsider um, and and say that it it is in, it, it is important as a part of a deterrent strategy. In order for the for, for the United States government to actually retaliate and impose costs against these hacking groups or other nation states or host states, which um, which are simply just you know allowing these organizations to 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 operate within their borders, it's important to impose costs, and those can have a great range from a criminal criminal response, uh, something within the the the, the criminal process. Uh, to actual sanctions against host states, to counter cyber attacks against uh, against nation states, you know, and, and above. Uh, so, so I think there's a good there's a menu of options as what can of what you can do in order to retaliate against hackers and host states. But but I think it really it also very much depends on the severity of the of, of the attack. You know, kind of kind of in the in the same line as what Tom was just talking about. So let's stop right there and just before we start talking about what the US government could or should do or shouldn't do, let's talk about the private companies and the, the, um, the, the examples that you gave from piracy. So Microsoft could strike back, they could kick them off their platform, right? Can you talk about the, the piracy issue of the bounty hunter? Can a, a Microsoft or anybody else who's attacked, can they, can, can Colonial Pipeline, can they get a bounty hunter to go and try to get their Bitcoin back or get their money back? I mean, the, 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 the used to be in the law, if Tom explained this more about how, you know, you could actually go and try to get your bullion back if you were the victim of pirates. Absolutely. The, from our, the birth of our republic, we, we adopted an international concept called letters of mark and reprisal. When you're a small, weak country with nothing much for a Navy, you count on armed privateers to do to work on your behalf. And you say, if you're going against these enemy countries, you may take these ships and there's a cost on the bad guys. Um, that has fallen into desuetude, really, um, especially in 1856, the Paris Declaration pretty much said, we're all serious countries now. We have serious militaries. These people, these freebooters are more trouble than they're worth. Let's just have this be done officially. And the mindset really hasn't changed that much um, since the Paris Declaration, even applying to cyber. Uh, however, it, as in everything in cyber, there are degrees. So is there a value in hiring great consultants or um, great, the, wonderful private sector firms that know the legal limits and have very talented people that can gather as much information as can be gathered legally and can put together all the information very quickly and then hand that off to the FBI or to the intelligence community or to the military. Absolutely. And we're, we're getting better at, at those connections. Um, but as far as actually going beyond that and doing the cyber version of, of kicking in a door and, and getting your bullion back, boy, as, as attractive as that would be morally and cinematically, um, you run into some problems. You start violating some of those seven federal statutes. Um, you have, have to do things that are federal crimes in the US in order to do that because it's the rarest thing in the world for one of these crimes to be launched with no US component. Um, uh, bad actors, for a variety of reasons, love to route their attacks through U.S. Um, components because federal law then applies. If you're going to look into them, you need search warrants. It's it it's um, the intelligence community walks away from it appropriately, and then it becomes a law enforcement problem. So you're really talking about American corporations having permission or not to do things within the United States. 
And that makes it a lot stickier and a lot more of a balancing issue. Not that the bad actors deserve to get away with it, but we might need to look at other tools, the toolkit for doing that. Okay. So Jonathan, moving up the food chain then from, from the private thing to the next steps, uh, what, what are the next steps that you think ought to be taken against ransomware purveyors, whether they're state or non-state? So I, I think that there's there's a, a couple of caveats before I say that of where ransomware escalates. And, and, I, and I think that they're, where they escalate to, to the level of the United States kind of going above what, what, what Tom was talking about, going above law enforcement. So I, I, I think that there is both the ransomware attacks which are disrupting critical infrastructure. And it's really not just the ransom at this point. It's, it's a, it is an attack which is bringing down you know, a, 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 a part of, of the United States uh, that, you know, that, that we have agreed upon, that you know, it's codified in law that you, you, know, you can't pass this threshold. Uh, so I think that there are those, there's also the, the ransomware looking attacks, uh, which I'll, I'll point to the, uh, to the NotPetya incidents uh, which were attacks in Ukraine that were kind of centered in Ukraine and then spread out across the world. I think this was in 2017 that looked like ransomware, but in fact were malware, which was intended to destroy, that was launched by the Russian government, intended to destroy its systems in, in Ukraine. So it, pointing to those where they, they start escalating up beyond the just a criminal activity. And in those cases, you, you basically get the... the you have, you have a series of options where it depends on your attribution. Are you attributing this to just a criminal organization without any nation state support? In this case, that's law enforcement. If you're attributing it to a criminal organization with some uh, support from a nation state, I think that's where you have the sanctions category of response that you can launch against that host state. And, and so the administration really, tried that, right? With China, they've, they've sanctioned some Chinese entities. I believe they sanctioned some Russian entities as well, right? Is it working? Um, so, I, so I was going to go into my last category where I think that you should take a much more active stance and, and you know, actually counter counterattacking. Uh, and, 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 in, and in those cases, those those really can range from a counter cyber attack, which is covert, to one that is overt, to a kinetic attack, uh, which is probably a very dangerous concept as far as escalation goes. But th those are those are your ranges of, of incidents. And people will argue about this back and forth too, of whether or not you take a covert cyber attack and retaliate covertly if you're really going to achieve your means because you just keep having this attribution problem where nobody knows that you really do something in response to this, uh, it kind of cuts, cuts in both directions. And to some extent, we might be in that world. You know, it's, 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 it's impossible to confirm whether or not these incidents get a covert cyber response. Uh, but the, you know, I, I, at least that's the part that some of my work on deterrence is arguing for is retaliating with a stronger hand. And that, that is something that we should be doing. Tom, do you want to weigh in on the, the categories here? So we've got, you know, legal, covert, over, strike back at the nation state level. Is that a legal construct? Uh, it, it, is it, the it, Biden administration it, thinking about it that way? I think it's a wonderful way for journalists to think about this. Um, yes. And uh, not speaking for the Biden administration, but I think any administration would be looking at the big picture and looking at a full panoply of tools that are available, and there is no shortage of tools. Um, when we're looking at what can be done, remember one thing is some lay people sometimes forget that cyber is not an all or nothing uh, um, type of tool. One of the nice things about a cyber capability for a decision maker is that there's a dimmer switch on it and you can dial up or dial down the duration, the intensity, um, the scope, the area um, affected, and that is those three um, variables are great for policymakers so they can calibrate what's going on. And even to avoid the escalation that John was talking about as a real concern, to avoid the escalation, um, have it be an iterative process so that 
there's no no response, so we can dial it up and cause more, more impose more costs. Oh, there's a mistaken response. They're taking this too seriously. We can dial it down so they we're we're not starting something or provoking something. So there are plenty of tools, and cyber is inherently um, very malleable that way. Uh, when it comes to the things that we can do, obviously we've got um, another layperson's um, misconception is that cyber attacks or cyber intrusions require a cyber response. And that's something we can do, but we don't have to do it. We have diplomacy. We have all sorts of things we can do in the information environment. We have military capabilities that don't always involve blowing things up, but there's a full spectrum of things we can do. Um, and then there's law enforcement. So we have a, a, a wide array of surgical instruments available to do what we want to do. And the other thing, I'd, the last thing I'd say about that is um, when it comes to uh, the idea of deterrence and just responding so there is a cost to this, most people intuitively agree that that's a good idea. Where the experts diverge is the idea that there has to be massive, clear, obvious, immediate cyber deterrence at the strategic level. Or if you look at um, the, the leading thinking in cybercom and um, in the government these days, whether it's Michael Fisher Keller or uh, um, uh, Hartnett or Goldman, the thinkers in this area are saying, no, it's much more of a day to day back and forth. So the real model is not so much nuclear deterrence, and I know no one has said that so far, but it's much more the broken window hypothesis. It's community policing where if you see uh, um, a young a young criminal uh, jumping a turnstile or throwing a rock through a window or spray painting and doing graffiti, you arrest them there and you're always out there, you're always engaged, you're, you're learning and they know they can't get away with it and try more serious things. And that seems to be a, a particularly apt metaphor for the complexity of cyberspace. So Jonathan, and let's take you back to uh, Vasu's uh, example earlier this morning where she said there was a tile store, a little local tile store you know, gets hacked, right? I don't think anyone can argue a national security imperative, but they're hacked by ransomware and nobody knows where it is. Let's just assume that the hacker is a non-state based in Russia, for example. What is, what is striking back in that context? What, what would it look like to you? It's tricky because if you have a lot of those, it's going to be really hard. I, I, I don't want to I, I don't want to pretend like striking back will happen. Uh, to be clear. And, and I think that it's the same, you, you can think about that in the, the non-cyber world as well. If there is a small value crime, you know, how much can law enforcement do if it's, you know, just chasing a lot of things. So, uh, so that might be true of the tile store, but this certainly sounds like something which is a law enforcement activity and, and that there are a few things of which case these companies can be doing, they can be looking at, uh, first of all, how they handle the incident right now, uh, how they are restoring their systems, uh, how they are handling the ransom, in which case I think everybody would discourage them from paying the ransom, but instead figuring out a way to restore without doing that. Um, and, and then how they are contacting local law enforcement contacting, you know, depending on, you know, on, on the, the level, contacting FBI, uh, the DHS is Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency, th these type of organizations to kind of share what has happened to them and, and what the best practices are for them to do, for, for what they should do next. And, you know, in the future, I, I think that for many companies out there, there are cyber insurance products that they can be buying, which can do a couple things that can kind of help them uh, financially with the event, but also help them line up a incident response plan for how to deal with the, you know, with future attacks. But this is expensive. So it's a tax, essentially, it's a, it's a tax against all businesses that they have to have this capability, right? This is a way of hurting the other country's GDP, even if you don't actually launch an attack. It is not 
free. However, uh, in many of these cases, I also think these organizations can follow, uh, they, can, they can, you know, there's always the follow best practices narrative, but, you know, there's some, so some truth to it of whether or not you can say, here are the three things CISA the, from DHS is saying, don't do. You know, they're, they're saying, you know, don't use out of date software where you're not able to, to, you know, install the most recent updates. Don't use old passwords that are, the, you know, that you could just do. The, what is the website? Have I been owned? You know, have I been found? Yeah. You log in. Okay. You, wait, and you log in and you see, yes, this, this account has been compromised um, uh, and it's pwned, not owned. <laughs> For those of you who go to the website. Um, but yeah, so you can go in and, and see has your password been compromised? This is out there in the dark web. Uh, there, there are these basic things that you can, you know, and, and they also say to, to use, uh, not to use single factor. I, I think it's just like three glaring things they're saying don't do. Uh, and, and so these organizations can, these companies, the small companies can navigate the expense of this by doing, you know, relatively simple things. But let's talk about how it escalates. So maybe you're a tile store and this isn't a national security issue. Then there was the meatpacking plant that was hacked. And then suddenly there was a declaration by the Trump administration. I think this is pretty bipartisan that meat is a national security issue. So suddenly meatpacking became part of critical national infrastructure. Was that an executive order? That's not a law, right? That's just an interpretation. How does that actually work legally? Obviously, you're, you're right. That's uh, that's executive regulation. So it has the force of law within the executive branch, which is what matters for the purpose of a cyber response, because that governs what uh, CISA is doing, what the Bureau is doing, what the intelligence community and DOD would be doing. So um, that is a perfectly good solution. That's the right level of solution for a problem that is bounded by what the executive branch is doing. Um, and looking at either the agricultural sector in general or components of it in particular as a critical infrastructure, uh, that's a pretty straightforward position. That's, that's, not too, um, that's not disputed too much, you're right. Um, but then once, once that, that has been designated, then there is a framework that exists, BPD 41, and there is a structure of how um, uh, large scale incidents will be dealt with, a division of labor among the departments, processes, planning structures um, that has been getting more and more robust, um, especially since the, the elections when we had a chance to really run a few laps with these authorities and, and actually do some of these things. So um, th there, are, there are ways of addressing these things that are increasingly good. Um, the one point I'd like to circle back to before I stop is, is that um, Jonathan was just was right that a, a part of it is that, um, you know, one of the, a, a good way of fighting burglary is having a really good home security system. So, so far, the, the financial incentives have been, look, this has been just like ocean liners running into icebergs. We, we can't, you know, it's not worth our while to guard ourselves against this sort of thing. But now it's getting more industrial and more regular. And so now it's, it's slowly becoming the, uh, the, the state of practice that this is expected. And that's excellent because it will raise the standards um, internally that it will be expected that you have the transparency, you have the logs, you have the on-site talent, you have the capability, you are doing the things you need to do, you have a plan in place. And the ultimate defense against um, ransomware is, is not, you know, roughing up some guys in St. Petersburg or in Shanghai, although that could be part of the solution, but really it's um, having a capability that if someone just turns off the light switch of your operation, you've got everything stored in a complete set of servers in Utah, or you're able to reconnect through a satellite network and get back up on uh, back in action. Uh, there was an attack recently in Sweden and um, Economist had a wonderful article on it, great reporting. And the Swedish company did absolutely everything right, um, including going to pencils and paper to do certain key things if they had to. And that completely neutered the attack. So there are some wonderful things we can do on the defensive side while not abandoning the federal role. 
um, there's a lot of ground that can be gained on the defensive side, company by company. So Jonathan, let's go back to your first point about the, the, the insurance. You had your list of um, questions we should ask. Let's talk about insurance companies saying, hey, we might not, we might want to pay for this. And companies maybe saying, oh boy, we better buy cyber insurance uh, uh, insurance and, and we ought to, you know, we have to be protected. So let's just deal with this like a business threat, not national security, but just like the burglar alarm, you got insurance in case you get broken into. Talk to us about that, um, the debate that's going on about that. So, yes. So th there are, I, I oftentimes look at cyber problems as basic incentives and what, what are the incentives uh, from the various players. And when you talk about insurance, uh, the, the incentives might not necessarily be aligned perfectly uh, for, for doing, for, for, for kind of, for doing the thing that's in this society's best interest. And after a ransomware attack, I think there's been plenty of great discussion of the insurers tend to pay out. They, they might, or, or they, you know, not all insurers pay out, but, but uh, many do and they'll pay the ransom. And we, I mean, very clearly that encourages future ransoms, uh, the, the continual paying out. Uh, and then insurers may even on a one-off incident have the incentive to continue uh, to, to actually pay that because it might just be cheaper if they're trying to, it might just be cheaper and easier and faster. And, and, and the faster itself makes it cheaper because you're having less business downtime, you're having less impact on the business's customers, you know, and so on that, that just really encourage paying the ransom. Uh, I, I think that insurers might find themselves as they are now, and there's discussion about this, seeing more of, more of the societal costs of paying ransom across their portfolio. That, you know, really they are, the more they pay ransoms, the more they, that, that practice is encouraged, the more they're losing across the portfolio from the large numbers. So that may help, but still, I mean, it's, you know, this is where it goes from, you know, what the individual company should be doing to what the insurer should be uh, doing to what, where there's a role of public policy and public policy really comes into that uh, when there's large, just when, when you get those large societal costs of, you know, individual actions. So th there's a range of that. Uh, Sunday, there's one other thing I wanted to follow back on a previous thing that you, that you were talking about that Tom made me think about um, is, you, and you had mentioned the GDP uh, aspect and, and that really where we should be concerned about that, because I certainly think that we can, that left, left as is, we can start talking about impacts to GDP uh, from cyber incidents, that they can start becoming larger and larger, uh, especially the knock-on effects of them, is that there are organizations out there, uh, companies out there, state and municipal organizations, which if they are attacked, have very large consequences. And the, there were recommendations from a, a report which you know, the, the cyber geeks and Tom and myself and others read from Cyberspace Solarium Commission, uh, which recommended that we actually look at entities out, that are out there which are systemically important. And that, that is a subset of the world. There are large companies, heavily interconnected companies, uh, which might also be small, which are very systemically important, which should get their own requirements and additional potentially support from government to, to protect them from attack. So we, we, we do wanna make sure that we are avoiding those large GDP events. So let me go back to the ransomware issue, Tom, as a lawyer, um, you know, should Congress pass a law that says the companies cannot pay ransomware? Because otherwise you've got this tragedy of the commons where it's in your personal interest, as John just explained, it's in your company's interest to pay, but it's in the national interest not to pay. That's where we have law, right? Um, yeah, yes, uh, there are, that's a, a bucket of worms as far as uh, how that would actually be crafted and the different, the countervailing interests. But the short answer is that I think that would be a net plus and that would be a good idea. Obviously, the, the, the very best answer is even in the absence, even not waiting for Congress to take that action, although that would be helpful, um, would be companies going directly to the FBI and then they reach out directly to the rest of the interagency. So when there's a significant incident, 
um, we all get a call, you know, late at night and, and the machine swings into action. Um, absolutely, the idea of uh, paying a ransom, uh, you know, encourages the next 10 attacks. So we, we don't want that as a society. Um, however, unless it's part of reeling in who did it, just as you can have a control drop for paying a ransom with a kidnapper, uh, where law enforcement never keeps its eyes off the, the ransom as it's, it's being picked up by the bad guys, it's possible also to do the same thing in with Bitcoin. And so we've seen reporting, uh, open reporting on this, that sometimes the answer is, yes, we think it's a good idea to make the payment. And then that payment in under certain circumstances can be traced right back to the malefactors and you can get some or all of it back. And at the very least, you can put those malefactors out of business. So um, it would, there are a couple of people that could act. The last thing I'll say is if not Congress, then states can act on this if they choose to. Uh, California has always been a leader in this area of experimenting with new things in cyber. And that's helpful to test things out before we make them national. And also insurance companies can have their requirements and they can simply say as a matter of contract law, you're not gonna get anything from us if you pay this off because it might be cheaper for that insured um, company, but the other thousand companies that insurance company um, insures, the insurance company is gonna be on the hook for far more payouts. So they can make it a term saying that you cannot pay the ransom. And instead on the front end, we'll work on continuity of business plans, response plans, information sharing and everything else. Okay, let's go back I'm still working my way up, Jonathan, your, your hierarchy, but let's go back to this issue of what happens once they, um, what happens if they're negligent or not negligent in the cyber realm. You talked about all the things that they, the three basic things that companies ought to do. So, uh, but we kind of know if we're running an ice cream store, we know what we're not supposed to do. If you leave a puddle of water on this floor and you're, somebody slips and falls, you're guilty, right? In the cyberspace, there's all these small companies that don't really know exactly what they're supposed to be doing or not supposed to be doing. Um, are we going to blame the victim then if, if, if they, you know, this is kind of a national problem with, you know, Russia kind of out to get us and then the little local tile store is stuck holding the bag because the insurance companies aren't going to pay and how are they supposed to defend themselves? Like, don't nation states exist to defend the little guy? How would you answer that? There's that narrative going along of, you know, what the Biden administration is responsible, whatever, the government's supposed to do something about this. It's not our fault as small businesses and we shouldn't have to pay for that. Yes, so I, I think that the negligence discussion is really fascinating and will continue to be so for a while. Um, I, I think that when you, when you look at some incidents and we can highlight a few, Colonial's one, you can say, well, you know, listen, they, these, these, if an organization didn't do those three basic things that CISA says you should do, um, that in Colonial's case, there was a specific warning from CISA to pipeline operators telling them that they are going to be at risk of ransom attacks a year before they were attacked. You know, it's, if they did not follow these basic things in light of the specific warning to them, I understand why people would start saying that's negligent and they should be held liable. Uh, and, you know, and, and I think that we will, you know, in that case, there is, there, there, you know, I think there's a class action from gas station owners uh, against them. And, and there's other such class actions that are out there. So we'll have to see as these things are being litigated, uh, what, where, where precedents will be set on, on determining what's negligent. But the other, the other way of thinking about this is really that, you know, these, this discussion is new. And that we can look back at, at other times, you know, we, we, we today we, we all, um, we to, you know, if we go back to the, the industrial in, in industrialization, you know, there, there was plenty of incidents where, you know, getting your hand cut off in a piece of machinery was, uh, was commonplace. And, and today, you know, it's, it is very obvious what to do. Uh, that, that there is a that, that there's investigations that come afterwards. There's OSHA that comes in and you know and says here's where you had a process that you know you didn't follow these safety progress processes and here's where the company is negligent. You know very specifically, and all of that just hasn't been set yet for cyber. So that ice cream store doesn't really understand 
where, uh, and, and it's not their fault that they don't understand, you know, where the boundaries are. I think that's something we're actively figuring out. And 10 years down the road, we may have completely figured out. There may be another OSHA type organization, you know, that, that is actually here to help after the fact. And, and, but there, there still is a barrier here. It's, you know, there's still a boundary here where if you are escalating up to something that is a nation state activity, and you were attacked by a very sophisticated actor, that the negligence argument you know, may fade and that may be clearly that's something which falls under the, uh, you know, the United States government, under DOD uh, type of territory, just as it would with you know, in, in other non-cyber domains. So moving up the food chain, let's talk about covert response. So uh, Tom, supposing that you didn't, the US government, you know, Biden's tried diplomacy, he told Putin to knock it off. Obviously that has not worked at least so far. So supposing the US were gonna retaliate in a covert way against uh, wherever, whatever host country it is, whether it's Russia or someone else, what would that look like? What would we actually do? And how would we keep it secret? Well, um, that's a great question. And obviously speaking at the unclassified level, because I don't want the FBI to burst in here and take me away, which would be the appropriate thing to do if I goon this up. Um, I would say that there, there are two words that um, some journalists don't always keep straight. And I would charge those listening to us today to make a distinction. And that is covert and clandestine. Covert means that the target never finds out that your government was behind whatever that action is. Clandestine means that the world never finds out about it, but it's crystal clear to that government. So there's some things you can imagine, just speaking categorically, that you might want to do in a covert means um, so that the US government's role in it was never known and perhaps that the target government never found out that it was this person. Um, speaking purely hypothetically, we could imagine um, a certain large former superpower and that they, um, in, instead of um, having the action appear to come from the United States, we might have um, one oligarch attacking another oligarch just to stir up more trouble or one intelligence agency attacking another one because they get along even less well than ours do. So you can imagine a lot of circumstances where a covert response would be a very good option to have. But there are others where clandestine might be the better way to go, where you want to keep your sources and methods and tools and tactics and procedures out of the public eye for very good reasons. But at the end of the day, you want the Ministry of State Security or the, you know, the supreme leader of that country to know that the United States knew who was doing this, found them, stopped them, and will do it again very quickly. And you want to be, you want to have that kind of private deterrence. Uh, and the good part about that tool is that not only is it surgical, but it also um, really cuts back on the danger of escalation because the, 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 the country no longer has to play to the world audience. No one knows that they've been gotten except for themselves. So it's, it's a, an excellent tool for presidents to have in case they need it. All right, we'll keep going up the food chain on to statewide retaliation, but we have an interesting question here from Karen Baird. Many US small cities and towns have been hijacked. Are there groups specifically assisting municipalities to help them fight this problem? I'll jump on that just very quickly. Yes, there are. Um, Chris Grebs, um, when he was running CISA, um, started this. And while it was done in an election context, uh, the connections made there, not just to the state level, but to counties, to cities, to tribes, to territories, um, that was incredibly successful as far as getting best practices out and, 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 and assisting in that sense. So CISA is just at the front end of having the money, the people, the expertise, the authorities, they need to do that. But um, the Cyber Solarium Commission was crystal clear when they said that one of their core recommendations was that CISA should be empowered to do this much bigger, much faster, much more. And I haven't met anyone in that has been involved in this that would disagree with that. So yes, CISA is at the front end of doing that. 
and so are other agencies. The FBI now has a special agent in every one of its field offices across the country. Every single one has a cyber specialized agent that is able to be the expert that swoops in immediately for law enforcement purposes and is able to call in whatever other assistance is needed. So we're slowly starting to do the right things to help states and local governments. Question, what is um, CISA? Can you explain what CISA is for those who haven't covered the agency and a number of journalists probably will need to now? Within the Department of Homeland Security, there is an organization that is now called CISA, C-I-S-A, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. And it exists to, to protect our cyber and other critical infrastructures across the country. Very few of them are owned by the federal government and very few of them actually are owned by government at any level. So it's an incredibly complex pro problem and CISA exists to bridge the gap between federal intelligence and capabilities and local ownership and local diversity and complexity. Um, Chris Krebs, big Chris Krebs fan, he did a marvelous job starting the ball rolling on this and they are moving forward very quickly with this with what I presume is bipartisan support. So moving up the food chain, diplomacy fails. Maybe we do something clandestine. Maybe we don't, we'll never know. Um, and we got to move up the food chain, Jonathan, and things are getting worse, which, you know, they are getting worse. What are the next steps when you say strike back hard? What's the next level of stuff that you, uh, that we ought to be thinking about or doing? And who's we? You know, I, I think that that certainly when, when we talk about striking back hard, it is moving into that clandestine space uh, that, that Tom was mentioning and, and really making sure that you are imposing a cost and the adversary knows that you're imposing that cost and feels it. Um, and so, so I think that there are, that, that is certainly a part of it. And, and there is a point at which, and I'm glad I'm not a part of making these difficult decisions, in which case you would also want the public to know uh, that you have this capacity and that you are imposing this cost. Uh, and I, I, I acknowledge that that's difficult. Um, there's another part which I will throw out there because I have no idea what the legality of this is other than it might be questionable, um, which is, is signaling the capacity to retaliate strongly uh, if you are attacked. And that is to say that, you know, if, if a, if a cyber attack crosses the line, that we have the capacity to impose a, a proportional harsh response against the adversary. And this is to, to borrow the, the nuclear analogy. It was easy when it was a bomb because you can just, you know, create a bomb down the street. You can blow up a bomb, um, you know, and film it on television. But with cyber, doing that risks revealing some of those those sources and methods that, that Tom was mentioning, you know, the, your, your tactics and procedures. Uh, so you have to be careful about uh, not just saying, you know, look at this code, because that would, the minute you show like, hey, here's this code that we could use to, to launch this malware at somebody, yeah, you know, that, that's allowing them to, to patch that. So it, if it is a signaling exercise, which kind of comes just up to imposing a cost, uh, that, that's the part that I think is of questionable legality. Um, but I, I think you would you would want to to do something like that to to really uh, uh, to to convey that capacity. Let's go to the um, the NSA though. Their cyber tools were hacked, and then we were informed in the public press that that tools that the United States had developed for things like Stuxnet and infiltrating Iran and all that were now being sold on the dark web and now being used against us and our own companies. Tom, can you, can you, are you, can you talk about that? No, I, um, uh, there's no good part of that um, other than that uh, uh, since that software is fairly well known, then it's the, the only good part about having your weapons stolen is you know how to dismantle them and defend against them. So it may take some effort to build those defenses and disseminate those defenses, but it's, it's much less threatening than having a, a, a brilliant creative enemy come up with something from scratch 
that you have to figure out from the very beginning. So it's, it's a, a second order threat and it needs to be uh, uh, addressed, but it's, it's not the scariest thing that an adversary nation state could, could do to us. Okay, it, it let's also talk highlighted a couple things just just to add to that, you know, of, of looking at the, the positives, you know, it, it highlighted the slow patching that that was that was a problem where the, you know, one of those was this eternal blue vulnerability in Microsoft systems uh, that, 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 that was in the, the, the NSA toolkit and, you know, that while Microsoft released the patch that well, after the event, you got the WannaCry events, you got the, the, the not Petya events, um, you had, you know, attacks on small towns like, you know, Baltimore is not a small town, but you had attacks on, you know, cities like Baltimore, which, which were exploiting a vulnerability which, to which there was a known patch. And, and I think it highlighted this problem uh, before it was the most severe event um, of essentially that was something that we did need to address. And you know, is and the easy category of just making sure that all of these all of these organizations are, are regularly patching their systems. Let me ask about for journalists who want to write about these issues, these tools that get you know swapped around the dark web and all of that. Uh, mostly journalists just interview cybersecurity researchers like yourself and say, where did this thing come from? Is there any ability for journalists to be able to cover this? Because obviously this is a sensitive area where the government frankly does not want journalists to be doing this kind of reporting. It's embarrassing. I don't think any administration wants to see these stories and it is absolutely journalists in you know mandate to try to do these stories. What kind of advice would you give them? I, you know, I, I think that Obviously, what you said is right as far as interviewing experts. Uh, that, that makes sense. I would say that generally, uh, there's there's a great range of the of the news outlets on cyber topics. There's really cyber specific ones where I just think there's fantastic reporting all the time about this from people who are who are you know cyber analysts themselves, really, um, who who are kind of digging into those details, and I I think they can kind of lead um, the charge on this. Uh, hopefully, there's not another event like that where where there's a whole bunch of leaked tool sets. So it's not a, an issue in the future. But you know, for other types of you know who done it and you know wh where where is the circulating on the dark web? I, I do think that there are great analysts out there who are part of you know uh, news outlets. So speaking of great, oh, go ahead, Tom. Oh, no, I would just add in that any journalist looking at it, um, obviously. Uh, Cyber has many pieces and parts, and I would just commend that journalist that she should, um, first of all, you know, there may be, uh, when it comes to the tools, the weapons that are actually being used, governments may not be too loquacious, but the marvelous um, private cybersecurity firms that are out there, and you could name five or six off the top of your head, they have people that um, are able to talk about these things because they what they find it's unclassified and they're able to talk about it so sometimes the best clearest information out there is not from governments but it's from these organizations who have excellent people that have found these things and have laid it open i mean ralph longer is the guy who opened up stuxnet for the world so that's the first thing as far as going to those firms for the tools um, at the lower end we've already talked about cyber hygiene you know, if a reporter's doing a story on why the car was stolen, maybe part of the story should be why were the windows down, the door unlocked, the keys in the ignition, the engine running. Um, maybe that should be part of the story. So um, that's that's something to, to look at the what part of it could have been prevented by good cyber hygiene. And then in between there are vulnerability disclosures. And that is between uh, Microsoft, which has given a lot of corporate attention to this, and the government, which has a process for this, when vulnerabilities are found, there's a process for deciding, no, we have to keep this for future governmental use against adversaries, or no, we need to tell everybody about this because our adversaries could use this in attack against um, our, our country or our allies and partners. So looking at the vulnerability dis uh, disclosure aspect of it, um, the idea, the third thing of vulnerabilities would be, did we know about this? What's the history of this vulnerability? Was it something, a, a known vulnerability that you know patches were out there as Jonathan said, or is it something new that had just been released or is it something that no one's talking about? Um, so I would commend the reporters to look at those three parts 
of an intrusion and, and probably get three good um, dimensions of the story. So speaking of stories that no one's talking about, um, as we're moving up Jonathan's hierarchy here, uh, Jeff Bezos's phone hack. It was reported that uh, in the open source that um, uh, the uh, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia phone was the source of this phishing hack that went through WhatsApp and went and hacked Jeff Bezos's phone. And that was widely reported. And there's been complete silence since. Um, is this a great story? And if so, how would reporters possibly cover this? I don't know how they would, <laughs> would cover it, but it is a fantastic story. Uh, <laughs> I can confirm that. <laughs> Okay, well, let's let's take this question though of retaliation. Um, you know, this was a, a a known figure, a a prominent figure who you know is a bit controversial given some uh, uh, beheaded journalists and um, that we know about. Um, is there a case, Jonathan, for you talking about strike back hard um, when you hack Jeff Bezos? Um, is there a case for a state retaliation against? Um, you know, whoever did this. Um, let me, I'll, I'll be clear because uh, Amazon's my favorite company and this is on the record that I do not care about Jeff Bezos. But the, the issue is, is more about what else happens on, on WhatsApp uh, and, and, and the, other, the other use from that same government of, of using WhatsApp vulnerabilities to you know, get back at journalists and other authoritarian governments who've used this to, to go after journalists that they fear are, are not you know, aligned with their authoritarian interests. I think that's, you know, Jeff, Jeff Bezos is a great lead to the story, but the story should be about you know, the other parts, uh, you know, truly. And, and, and I, cause I think those are much more concerning and opportunities where, uh, you should have a where you could have U.S. government involvement uh, of uh, of both of both in in working with WhatsApp uh, to kind of fix these issues uh, and and as well kind of you know if if it this is against a protected group so right so so I think that there are, there are definitely possible legal actions uh, that that should be considered. Um, obviously, one of the neat parts of the U.S. cybersecurity law, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, is that in addition to those seven federal crimes that exist that are very general and can be put together to, to, um, um, to be pointed against most cyber intrusions, one, you know, one or more of them can be put together, uh, at the very end of that, uh, there's a, a provision that gives a civil cause of action for each of those. So if the federal government doesn't think that this was um, a crime against the United States or a criminal action that can be prosecuted and to beyond a reasonable doubt to that 99% st um, uh, certainty standard, um, it gives another option. And then the victim is able to, especially a victim with deep pockets. So let's just imagine an internet billionaire um, that he could go to his lawyers and simply say, uh, I want you to use the civil cause of action here. And the three things that those people did to me that would violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, um, we're gonna sue them for that. And they would come up with a number. And the, the, the good thing about that for the victim is it's no longer beyond a reasonable doubt. It's merely preponderance of the evidence. So wherever you can make a private attorney general out of a corporation that's, or a person, but a corporation that's rich enough to be able to mount its own legal counterattack, uh, the standard they need to meet is so much more reasonable and so much easier than you are improving your legal immune system against cyber attack by an order of magnitude. So there's more work we can do in that area, but it's, it's a great, not for the mom and pop ice cream shop that you talked about earlier, but for Amazon and for the, the others, um, it is a, a great way to add to our, our defensive horsepower. But notice that Microsoft didn't sue the Chinese over solar wind. Microsoft got the Justice Department to do it for them, which one would argue is a very clever strategy. Kudos to Microsoft. Um, but the gov US government has been very slow and reluctant to bring these suits. Should they do more? I mean, well, should the U.S. government be be bringing? Should the Justice Department be bringing a suit on the Bezos case? 
It's pretty outrageous. Um, it, it, you know, every case should stand on its own merits. But having said that, um, obviously the the China problem is um, there's so many parts to that relationship. There's the financial part. There's no corporation would want to be the one that steps forward like Spartacus and said, yes, I'm going to sue the Chinese government because they'd get pounded like cheap veal and all of their competitors would fill that market space. So you don't have to be an MBA, which I am not, to figure out why corporations are not doing that, even when as a legal matter, it's obvious that they could. There's the policy matter or the business sense matter, which said not in a million years. And to a lesser extent, that's true of governments, maybe less us, although we are very interconnected with the Chinese, but any government smaller than the Chinese government or any economy smaller than the Chinese economy really has to think twice before ticking off the Chinese, who without using any military or diplomatic power can simply hit the economic dimmer switch and cause a certain amount of pain. So there are, that could be used as an excuse for doing nothing, but it's certainly something that needs to be weighed when deciding what's going to be done about a cyber intrusion. So John, let's just keep going up your uh, hierarchy of, of, um, of striking back options here. Um, for obvious reasons, uh, the US administration has not struck back directly at Russia, even though Russia has been clearly the source of known and proven public record threats. Pressure on Biden is obviously going to increase. Um, as particularly, I would argue, after Afghanistan, where he doesn't want to look weak. Um, what do you see happening uh, on the federal level here? And the national security uh, memorandum that just came out published sort of, you know, raises the bar here for the U.S. government's responsibility to, you know, do something about the problem. How do you, how is this going to play out, you think, in the next six months? And how should journalists try to cover that story? Well, I mean, I, I do think that journalists should be continually asking this question um, after after incidents, uh, uh, you know, after each cyber attack. Uh, the the you know, where is the the punitive action? And it th this is this is certainly difficult from the administration side uh, uh, as far as balancing. There's, there's a lot to consider with the retaliation, um, you know, balancing the risks of, of further escalation um, of, of tit for tat, I, I think are, are all problems that, that they have to, to weigh. But it is, it is certainly clear that from a deterrence strategy standpoint, that when you say you're going to retaliate about something, you need to retaliate against it. Uh, otherwise, you have really weakened your deterrent strategy. So I, I think that it's very difficult to to know how they how you know what what in that long list of possible actions you know what what is the what's the right level of of retaliation. But it's clear that there needs to be that um, when it comes to nation state attacks. And you know we, we again we're kind of they're still mixing a lot of things and. The run of the mill ransomware attack is not in this category, but when you do come into this category and you're talking about solar winds, it is, uh, and and you're talking about incidents which go beyond espionage. Another important distinction uh, that then you you do need to have a you know a tangible retaliation. Actually, now that you've mentioned espionage, can we have a definition, a working definition, at least for journalists? Where is the line between espionage and, um, you know, an act of war, which I get is in the uh, policy issue, but at some point there, it's a blurry line, right? Where are we crossing that, Tom? I would say, uh, taking a first whack at that, that espionage is very clear in that it is the gathering of information by a nation state against another nation state. And it is the gathering of information. All countries agree on that. And almost all countries that are able to gather information for their decision makers do so. Some are more capable than others. Um, where there is an area of disagreement is gathering information that is intellectual property, not for national security against military or intelligence capabilities, but simply stealing corporate secrets as a part of a general effort to boost a national economy with stolen information. Most countries agree that is not part of 
what the international community accepts as quote unquote legitimate espionage, but rather a smaller number of very um, active countries are doing that outer um, type of intellectual property theft, which is more like um, theft than, than traditional espionage. Um, as far as the difference between espionage and military activity, the real thing is that espionage is, is oriented toward not, not being discovered and leaving no tracks at all. So if you're in a computer system and anything gets broken, you failed your mission. They should never know you were there or that you could get back in whenever you want. When it's a military mission, you're there to do something. So if it's espionage, then there should be no effects at all. And that's a very clean line for military. Where it gets blurred is special activities that are not exactly the same as blowing up a building, but using certain technical capabilities to do certain things. And the hardest case is, planting a cyber capability in a, say, a national critical infrastructure that does no damage at all, that is undetectable. But if the war starts, then back in the enemy capital, they can press a button and all of a sudden that power plant fails or that pipeline blows up or that air traffic control system goes dark. And so then we have, that's where drawing the line is very difficult. But most countries would view that as sabotage, um, not espionage, even if it has not been completed yet, leaving the metaphorical equivalent of a satchel charge underneath another country's bridge abutment um, is not the same as reconnaissance. And most countries would see that as sabotage, which is closer to military and has its own remedies. Okay, so by using that definition, though it's been publicly reported that the Russians, for example, have planted malware in the US electrical grid um, and that it could be activated even if it has not been activated and there hasn't been a US response. So by your standard, that's sort of a clear um, case in which the US could under international law be justified in responding because it's not sabotage? Because it, it, it is it sabotage because they've left it, it, it there? It, it depends on the degree of the, the two questions you always ask are what would the damage be if the button gets pressed? What does the worst case scenario look like? You take that and then you go, what is the likelihood? If this is just um, seeing if they can plant a cyber charge and seeing if they can do it and part of exercises and operations and testing, then that's a much lower threat in the short term than something that, no, we know they have a war plan that will do this, or no, we've intercept, intercepted communications that say, this is merely the first step in something they're planning to do. So I would imagine it's much more the former where we're in the early days of doing these things and the Russians are just trying to see what they can get away with. And so uh, perhaps that has been guiding our more limited response in this area. So Jonathan, let me go back to something, the, your argument. Um, you're basically arguing along a classic deterrence theory, right? There's deterrence by denial or deterrence by punishment. You're saying we should do everything to do deterrence by denial, make it harder for them to do it. But at some point we gotta do deterrence by punishment. Otherwise the, cred is, the threat isn't credible. Can I push you a little further on where you think that line is? Because you're in favor of striking back harder. Can you give us more about how do journalists even ask these questions? Where, how far we're gonna go? Yes, well, th there's, there, there are a couple things I would, I would put into that, you know, and, and I'll carry the, that, that are not obvious, in, you know, not traditional denial, but, but I think kind of go in that direction. Uh, and you pointed out the power grid stuff, there, there is something we could do, which is to make the power grid more resilient to outages. Um, and, and those have a lot of benefits because they, they benefit against you know, non-cyber incidents, um, uh, uh, as well as, and, and we highlighted this in the report actually, um, that, you know, they have those benefits, but they also have the benefits of you know when of, of, of saying to attackers that yes even if you do carry out this attack on this part of the grid you're not going to get a cascading failure it's going to be an isolated incident uh, which you know which is not going to have this big you know east coast power outage or something you're not going to achieve that effect uh, so I, I think that they're entering that into the denial part of it 
but but I yeah I, I think in the, in the punishment side uh, you you really I, I suppose your question Sonny is to to kind of say how far can you go is is that the idea I guess my question is you know journalists don't uh, don't study deterrence theory so they're not going to think about it this way but there is this question of at some point, if you don't punish them, they'll do it again. And we're arguing, there's an argument about where that point is, right? That so far, nobody's been punished enough to make anybody stop. I think everybody agrees on that. Where we should go, I don't know. But do you have any sense of how, what would you have to do to make this stop? I'm not sure about, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, um, we, we, outside of a, you know, a classified world, uh, it's hard to confirm whether a deterrent strategy is not working uh, because we don't know, you know, it, a lot of the incidents that we're talking about have not risen above the level where you would get a large uh, military response. That we know uh, about. Right, right. Uh, okay. so, so I think that, so I, I think that that is, is 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 the important detail uh, when thinking about the deterrence uh, discussion, but otherwise, it there should be a careful use of of thresholds and you know do not cross this line. This will be the response um, discussion, which you know still in the classical deterrence theory uh, angle needs to be credible. And to be credible, you kind of, you, you both, you have to do something, you know, you, you have to show that you, that you can do it. And, and, and uh, that, I think that is a, a major hangout for cyber. I, I would agree with Jonathan on that. And I would add that one of the more helpful things that we've come up with is we know that traditional deterrence works great against nation states and against catastrophic actions. We know that from 70 years of nuclear deterrence and mutual assured destruction, and we know that no other modalities have been used by nation states to cause catastrophic destruction. If you have non-nation states or below catastrophic destruction, then massive um, deterrence does not seem to be effective because there's no one to deter. It's not a country. There's no return address. or they know that you're not going to pull out the big bombs for this lesser kind of threat. So then we're left with the, the idea of restrictive deterrence. And I think that is a great concept for cyber. The idea that, yes, for big things, absolutely. If you kill thousands of our citizens and do this, then there will be an awesome response. And there should be zero ambiguity about that. Um, but for lesser things, then maybe it's, um, nuclear deterrence doesn't work against a guy who's um, stealing appliances. You need to have a police officer there. So the way restrictive deterrence would work is that, yes, you're actually addressing each kind of cyber action, but you're addressing it forcefully at the right level, case by case. That's a real fractal problem because that's an awful lot of stuff to keep an eye on. But there's no reason to think that you can't deter a nation state from catastrophic action with serious strategic consequences and also deter a cyber criminal by making it much less, uh, making ransomware much less attractive because the targets are harder and we are better at tracking down individuals and throwing the book at them. So we can do the full spectrum of deterrence from the nation state down to the individual if we're smart enough and if we work with our allies and partners closely enough. Okay. Any last questions out there? Please raise your hand or drop your questions in the chat. I'd like to come back to just financial accountability, back to the money, which seems to drive a lot of these um, uh, issues. Uh, what, for, for the point of view of business reporters and business journalists, in terms of the cost to the economy and back to the question of GDP, um, Shareholders, we're sitting in the EY Davis uh, studio here. Evelyn Y. Davis was a shareholder advocate. If shareholders are having to pay the bill for this, at what point do they want to adopt 
um, you know, their own security? At what point is it worth it for shareholders to say, hey, corporations, this is getting really bloody expensive. We want you to do something about this. We want you to put a stop to this. And it becomes really a, not a government issue, but a kind of private sector financial, um, this is just too expensive issue. And is that, would that be a good thing for national security if it didn't escalate and it just kept in the financial sphere and it didn't go up the chain? So I, I, I really like this angle um, a lot. And I, and I think you start talking about non-cyber organizations like you know, the SEC and what the SEC should be requiring companies to, to, to disclose to, those co to their shareholders. Uh, I, I think that's really important. So that there, there is different types of disclosures uh, that, that, that we should involve in this discussion. The, the, you know, the ex post ones, which is to say, Yes, we were hit with these incidents. Here's how many cybersecurity incidents we have had. Here's where we paid, you know, somebody X number of dollars in Bitcoin um, and so on. And I, I think that should be transparent to shareholders and can go a long way for us determining, you know, which companies are good at this and bad at it. But there's also the ex ante stuff, which is to say, here is here are the vulnerabilities that our company might have to a cyber attack. Uh, and that's something actively, you know, me and a couple others are actively working on, on, on that discussion and, and, you know, exactly what types of, where companies have significant exposures to data breaches from their relationship to, you know, the other softwares that they're using or, or something like that would enable, uh, not, not your run of the mill shareholder, but, you know, potentially, you know, other, other, uh, other agencies who in, in, in organizations who who are capable of you know taking that information you know checking it with other vulnerabilities to, to really look at where their risks are across their portfolio uh, those would be your you know your large investors those would be your uh, insurance companies could use those type of disclosures as well so I, I think there's a lot to add to that type of discussion and the the where market mechanisms can help it incentivize again companies towards better cybersecurity practices are, are I think are fantastic. So let me just say that we had a briefing um, earlier this year um, with Rob Wells, a journalism expert who what, briefed reporters on how to find stuff in the SEC documents. And we'll drop that in the chat and make that available. Um, Tom, could you tell us legally, I, I know you're not a Securities and Exchange Commission lawyer, but um, you know, there's been a lot of hiding by the companies as we discussed of not disclosing it. What do companies have to do? And can report, should reporters start digging through these SEC documents in the fine print and in the risk part and in the final part, what they actually paid? Should they start looking for these kinds of payouts and reporting on them? And do the companies have to disclose this? Um, the, the short answer is companies don't have to disclose um, a lot of the fine grained detail that makes all the difference in the world. Uh, they're able to um, report very gener in very generic terms, and there are a lot of limitations on that. Um, one is uh, um, the California law was that a requirement that companies have to report when they've been the victim of a cyber attack, a significant cyber attack. And the idea being by making it transparent, it would be in the company's interest, not only to uh, remediate as quickly as possible, but to do everything they could within reason to prevent that attack, because if they had to go public, they would look bad vis-a-vis -vis their competitors, their customers wouldn't like them, the shareholders would rebel against the board, the board would go against the CEO. So that made sense, but there's always a second order effect. And so the, there was a clause in there saying, but you don't have to report on it during the course of your investigation, because that would give away what you know and it would tip off the attackers. Well, now investigations start going from days to years. And so um, there, are, there are ways to, to obfuscate and not exact, not break the law, but, but reach the outermost limits of the law in reporting. So hopefully good reporters will, will do the line by line accounting of those things, but just, you know, we'll know enough to talk to the IT bubbas in that company and get a conversation going or talk to the CEO or talk to competitors and get their ideas of what was and wasn't done. 
And um, there's no one of those things that would be the, 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 the flaming truth, but probably by probing each of those different points, the reporter would get a pretty clear idea of, of what was done and what the company failed to do. Okay, thank you for the best great source tutorial on how to crack an incredibly difficult problem. And thank you for taking these very hard questions. Um, Tom Wingfield and John Welburn, thank you. Um, this is the National Press Foundation. This will be recorded and we will have a transcript um, online in the next couple of days. Thanks so much. Thank you.